What an absolute pleasure to be here. I think this is possibly my last trip out of Yorkshire for some time. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, perfect to come to, to this, this island. I've been to the Channel Islands a few times, mainly Oldney, actually, but never Jersey. So I'm very excited to be here. And, uh, and it's great to talk to, uh, to you members. OK, so that's roughly what I'm going to talk about. Probably go off piste a little bit. So I want to talk about rewilding, of course. It's not a replacement for nature conservation, it's an addition to traditional nature conservation and I want to inspire you that rewilding is possible. It's really important in the context of Europe, but I think it's important for islands as well. Talk about how it came about, some of the opportunities, and then kind of pick up the narrative, the new narrative that rewilding offers you. And I'll talk about some of the case studies that we've got around Europe. So where did it start? Well, in a way, it started here in Yellowstone National Park. So um, this is in the USA, of course. And it started with a simple species reintroduction project. So, so Yellowstone Park authorities they wanted to reintroduce the wolves. They'd been wiped out for farming and all the rest of it. So, um, so they wanted to reintroduce wolves, fairly straightforward, bring the wolves back, and off you go. And something very interesting happened when they introduced wolves. And they call it the ecology of fear. So they, the wolves prey on, on elk and moose and so on, or moose as they call it in the USA, um, and elk, which is really what we would call deer. But anyway, um, and, and what they found was these animals, rather than um, grazing along the riverbank where the, the vegetation is nice and lush, they, started, they stopped grazing along the riverbank because if you're an animal that's going to be preyed on by wolves, it's better to have a 360 vision rather than a 180 vision. So they stopped grazing the riverbanks and the riverbanks sprouted back up again. Suddenly there were alders and sallows and willows and, and so on. And fantastic. And then the beavers, population suddenly expanded because, of course, they had their food availability. And beavers, of course, put dams into the rivers and the rivers started to recreate the wetlands and recreate the floodplain wetlands. And those, those st still areas meant that the river speeded up in other areas. So the riffles recreated. And because the riffles recreated, it meant that the salmon could come back because they had more spawning areas. And suddenly, the wildlife of Yellowstone started to boom and become much more diverse and much more abundant. And the, the rewilders of the Americas call this the three C's concepts. They talk about core area, Yellowstone National Park, um, connected area, Yellowstone's actually quite big, if only we had things like that in the UK, um, and, um, and, cr and crucially, carnivores, so top, top keystone species. And what I mean by keystone species, these are the species that are so important in the way that they interact in, the, in their ecology. They, actually change the ecology. We're obviously a massive keystone species, normally in a negative way, but not always. The other example at the beginning of this story is um, the so-called Pleistocene rewilding, so a slightly different take on rewilding. So here in Siberia, what, what some of the Russian scientists realised was actually, at one time, the Siberian grasslands, or Siberian mosslands as they are now, um, were actually inhabited by the mega herbivores. We're talking about things like bison and wild horses, um, uh, woolly mammoths and so on. And as humans came back, when the ice left Siberia, and as humans came back, all of those mega herbivores were wiped out. And actually you can see that pattern across the globe. So it started here in Europe. So people came out of Africa, they came up into, the, into those cold lands in northern Europe, and they exterminated the mega herbivores, the bison, the horses, the, uh, and so on. And, and that happened about 12,000 years ago. So we had actually largely lost our mega herbivores by about 12,000 years ago. Um, in Siberia, it actually took a bit longer because the ice retreated a bit, a bit slower. Um, and so it was actually only about 5,000 years ago. In fact, on Wrangell Island, there were still woolly mammoths only 3,000 years ago. Incredible. And, that, and that's when humans first came onto Wrangell Island. Um, and, of course, in the Americas, it happened much later. So, really, the arrival of Europeans rather than uh, the first settlers. So, the first settlers took out things like giant sloths, and then the Europeans finished it off with removing all of the bisons. And in Africa, it never quite happened, maybe because African mega herbivores evolved with humans. So, it never quite got there, although clearly we're trying to do that at the moment. And maybe what we're doing now is losing the mega herbivores of Africa with great effect. But these scientists realised that these mega herbivores had a deep impact on their local ecosystem. So at one time, as this picture shows, these mega herbivores were, were creating these grassland landscapes. 
And once the mega herbivores disappeared, it turned into sort of shrubby, mossy landscapes, which actually qu are quite dark. And they absorb the summer heat. And so that the soils of the perma, the, the top layer of the, of the permafrost, is actually quite warm in the summer, but the summer's very short. Of course, with global warming, that summer's extending, it's becoming hotter, the permafrost is melting, it's releasing vast clouds of methane into the atmosphere, very virulent greenhouse gas. And what these mega herbivores do is by returning it to a grassland ecosystem, they trample out the mosses and so on, and they create a much lighter vegetation which reflects the, sun back, the sunshine back, the, the sunlight back into the atmosphere and keeps that surface layer cooler and therefore keeps the permafrost lasting for a bit longer. So these scientists are saying, look, we need to re return the mega herbivores of Siberia to protect the planetary ecosystem as we transition to zero carbon, if we ever do that. Closer to home, here in, uh, just over the channel in the Netherlands, another example, really famous example, by a chap called Franz Vera. And this was based on a polder. So this polder had been recreated, had been taken back from the sea, taken back from the sea, been dammed up from the sea uh, in the late 60s. Um, it's a place called Uswaldeplazen. And that land was going to be developed for industry, but because of the uh, 1973 oil price shock, it was never, never developed. So this huge polder, 6,000 hectares, a big, big site, was just left, abandoned. And wildlife moved in, and, you know, and the, bird, the birders in that area particularly thought it was great, you know, low waders, geese, and, and, and so on. And, of course, you'd expect that ecological succession would then happen. So, you know, it's a kind of, it was originally mudflat, and then it became, was enclosed and dried out, a bit of water, um, became quite grassy, and then you'd expect the scrub to move in and the forest to move in didn't happen. And Franz Re Vera realised the reason that it didn't happen is because geese were grazing out the succession. They were stopping the succession. They were creating a disturbance factor that stopped that succession. So it never really uh, succeeded into woodlands. And what he then postulated was actually, when you think about Europe, we always think of Europe, if we go back, you know, before agriculture, it would have been unbroken forest, you know, so that a red squirrel could bounce its way from Kiev all the way across to, say, uh, a, a, across the Calais. But no, in fact, Franz Vera said, no, no, it wouldn't have been like that at all. It would be much more like the savannah in Africa where the mega herbivores still exist, an open landscape. And that, and that makes sense because half of our land-based biodiversity is actually of open habitats, not of woodland habitats. And how could that have been? So that made sense. So he then, he then said, well, what we need to do is we need to test that theory here and we'll bring in some of those mega herbivores. We'll bring in wild cattle. Well, they're extinct. So he used, uh, he used uh, heck cattle, which are similar to aurochs, the original wild cattle. Bring in wild horses, oh, they're extinct too. So he brought in um, uh, conic ponies in that particular case. And then he brought in red deer and so on. And, he, and, and what he postulated is it wasn't predators that, that has the population booming and busting and the forest and the scrub expanding back and forth. Actually, it was food availability. So if we let this experiment run, the population would boom Animals would then starve, there'd be fantastic meat for scavengers and all the rest of it, and they would create this incredibly diverse ecosystem. The only problem with that, of course, is there's a commuter line that runs along this Osvelde Plaza and straight into Amsterdam. In fact, it's only about 10 miles from Amsterdam, and the good commuters of Amsterdam really didn't like to see starving ponies, understandable, so the experiment was stopped. But nevertheless, very, very interesting, and Dutch rewilders then moved on and said, well, look, there were these massive floods in, in Netherlands in 2000, the Rhine flooding across and killing people in places like Rotterdam and so on. And they said, and the Dutch engineers said, well, what do we do about that? We can either build massive walls through the middle of Rotterdam and the other Dutch cities, or we could allow our floodplains to flood and store the water on floodplains rather than people's homes, which is actually pretty sensible, really, isn't it? Um, but, of course, those floodplains were farms. So what the Dutch government did is said, well, what we'll do is we'll buy out the farmers, we'll move the, far we'll move the farmers elsewhere. In fact, what they did is they bought land elsewhere, swapped it with the farmers on the floodplain, and then that would allow them to move the flood walls back to the edge of the floodplain, allow that floodplain to store water and save lives. Really important stuff. But what do you actually then do with the land? You know, because... It could get quite expensive, isn't it? If we turned it into a nature reserve, it could be very expensive managing all of that. So they used these rewilding techniques and, and again, introduced, in this case, wild, wild horses equivalents, so um, in this case, Konix and, and Exmoor ponies, 
uh, and brought in uh, cattle and so on, and then managed it in a sort of kept wild way. And the costs of that management are very low, and something else then started to happen. And they kind of expected this, but they didn't know quite how it would go. Because at low, low levels, when the Rhine is low, the sand started blowing into on the floodplain and creating these inland sand dunes. The first time this community had been seen in Holland, probably for a thousand years. The scrub grew up in places, of course, and fantastic bird life in that. But in other areas, the cattle and the horses were keeping the grass low. So you've got this incredible diversity. Wildlife absolutely bounded. Things like white-tailed sea eagle had never been, never bred in Holland as in living memory suddenly came back to the Netherlands. A black stork coming back to the Netherlands, white storks everywhere, fantastic diversity. And, and, and all very, very cheaply done because of this rewilding principle. So if we, and then one more example in, uh, in England, so this is the Nep Estates, this is an arable farm, or was an arable farm, and this arable farm was um, managed um, in a traditional way intensive arable uh, agriculture and because it's a very heavy soil um, just very difficult to work for agriculture so a lot of input cost and not a lot of output cost so for two out of three years it would actually lose money not make money and the borough said you know this is kind of ridiculous you know we, 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 we we're killing ourselves to lose money what's the point of that is there a different way of managing this land and what they did was they built a ring fence they used these principles that have been used in places like Os Ostwelderplazen, and in the Dutch rewilding examples, built a ring fence, introduced wild cattle, well, that's extinct, so they used uh, English longhorns, uh, wild horses, extinct, Exmoor ponies, um, brought in some red deer, roe deer were there already, brought in wild boar, ah, not allowed to do that under the Dangerous Animals Act, so they used Tamworth pigs instead, and, and look at the result. Incredible. Suddenly, there was scrub, there was forest, there was pasture, there were lakes. And some of these species, incredibly rare species, I mean, we're talking turtle dove, nightingale, purple emperor, butterflies that had never been seen in this part of Sussex, magically appeared. Not just magically appeared, these are now the biggest populations of these three species in all of southern England because of that rewilding experiment. Absolutely phenomenal stuff. So out of these examples, we can see some themes starting to develop. So the first theme is this one I call trophic complexity. We can call that the, the stuff of life. And you can see the sort of thing that happens. You know, here's an example from the wild boar and all the stuff that wild boar does and how it changes its ecosystem. The bison and the mega herbivore that pushes trees over and eats the leaves and eats grasses, creates glades in the woodlands and so on. So that trophic complexity and this concept of keystone species is a critical part of rewilding. Secondly, disturbance. This is a British river, but you hardly ever see rivers like this in Britain. So this is the River Nethy through Abernethy RSBB Reserve. And you can see the disturbance that's going on, so natural processes. We've got a landslide here that's pushed through the forest, created a load of gravel and siltation. We've got a lightning strike hole in there. We've got these riffles and pools in the riverside there. We've got wood, dead wood everywhere and so on. Really quite difficult to find that in our tidy, tidy way of working uh, things. But by having those natural processes, it creates in an awful lot of diversity in the landscape. The sand dunes in the, in the River Rhine floodplain or the beavers creating wetlands as they built those things. It's that sort of diversity. And then the third theme is this idea of dispersal and connectivity, that actually, if you have islands of fantastic habitat, but in a sea of difficult to get across habitat, that island becomes very vulnerable. And it's one of the key drivers of local extinctions uh, in the British Isles, is this, is this uh, let's call it the theory of island biogeography, but let's just call it, you know, little islands really don't work very well. And you know, so this is the Southern Carpathians in Romania, and here are these beautiful kind of upland meadows, and they're full of fantastic wildlife. But the real, I mean, and they are, oh, God, gorgeous wildlife. But the real thing in this picture is that that woodland stretches for a thousand miles. And no wonder it's full of bears and wolves and wild boar at, in abundance. You know, it's a fantastic connected environment. So it's got one of those ingredients of the three things. And we can start to connect all of this together into some sort of a theoretical thing. And, and, th and there was a paper written last year looking at this, and it says, here are the three components of rewilding. Dispersal, 
trophic complexity, lots of stuff, um, and stochastic, I don't even know what that means, but I think it means random, random disturbances or natural processes. And you can see here, so here's a red-backed shrike, extinct in southern England. Why is it extinct and still abundant in places like Poland? Because if you go to somewhere like Poland, it's, much, it's a much messier landscape, if that's what you want to think about. It has slightly abandoned field corners, scrubby edges, hedges going off, connectivity, a bit of this, a bit of that. And it allows species like red, red, red bat shite to, to, to thrive in that landscape and many, many other species. And the important thing is then, when you start thinking through rewilding, what you see is that we're not talking about some sort of step back to some imagined past. We're talking about something that's very progressive. So as we reconnect wildlife, as we recreate natural processes, as we reconnect islands together, we start to reconnect the weft of life together and pull back and pull it all together into a beautiful world of future. We don't know what that future is, but a, a, a world of future. It's very much about progressive. This is actually quite a long way from the nature conservation that I practice for most of my career. So if you think about a, a, a classic nature reserve, we would say, here's a nature reserve, this is the special interest, so we need to do this, this, and this in order to maintain this special interest, forgetting, forgetting what, well, what was that baseline? And what is the special interest? Is it, am I going back to some sort of imagined 1940s pre-industrial agricultural past, or shall I go back to the 17th century, or shall I go back to the beginning of the Holocene? I, it's ridiculous in, a, in an era of climate change. What rewilding says is forget about the outcome, forget about the objective, just set the rewilding interventions and see what nature does. It's a very progressive way of looking at things. It's also very relevant in the concept of European. So this map of, of Europe, so this map shows land that is no longer, once was used for agriculture and is no longer used for agriculture. And it's not that agriculture is even uneconomic in some of these areas because it's very subsidy driven, no, there's a lot of subsidy put into agriculture. The issue is that young people are saying, well, you know, I have to work incredibly long hours at the weekend too and earn very little money. And actually, I could go into the cities and the towns and, and, and just have a better life with more money. And that's what they're doing. So the land is no longer being used for agriculture. And in a sense, that's great for wildlife. Of course, it is, because land abandonment may, generally means more, more wildlife. But it's not good for the rural economy. And, um, and you can see this, this concept called like empty Spain concept or the empty... Uh, inner heart of Italy concept. You can see massive rural depopulation uh, in Portugal and so on. Um, and, and so what do you do with this land? Is there a way of using this comeback of wildlife, this regeneration of wildlife in these former agricultural areas to change that relationship between humans and nature and to create prosperity out of this? And, and rewilding is taking you towards that as we examine some of those opportunities and I'll come back to that. My other message is, this is even more relevant in the marine realm. So if you think about the marine realm, seas around here, it's already a very connected environment, beautifully connected. In fact, you couldn't get more connected ecologically. It already has a huge amount of natural process going on. Tides ripping through, storms, waves, all that kind of stuff. So there's lots of, there's lots of dynamism within, within the marine environment. The thing that it's missing is the trophic complexity or the abundance and the diversity of wildlife because we fished much of it out. So the big stuff has gone. We used to have in the English Channel blue whales. We used to have massive tuna. All of those sorts of big, big species have disappeared a long time ago. But it's easy to get back in the marine environment. So things like highly protected marine areas or marine national parks allows that comeback to happen. And in fact, it's much, much quicker in the marine world than, in, than on land. So the scientists say, maybe only 20 or 30 years and you could get that comeback if you protect enough of it. And it's not even anti-fishing this. You know, what's lovely about this idea is that if we protect, say, roughly, so the scientists say, 30% of the seas from fishing, such is the wildlife comeback that the fish abundance in the remaining 70% um, is even higher. So there's even more fish to fish. So it's an absolutely straightforward win-win as long as we do it. And I mean, could there be anywhere more relevant than somewhere like Jersey if to start thinking through this concept of, 
of, of marine re rewilding. So we know um, how to bring back wildlife. I mean, here's an example. This was an old, this is uh, from one of my old reserves in Yorkshire Wildlife Trust. And this is a fish, this was a fish farm. So it's an intensive fish farm and it was polluting this beautiful chalk stream that runs through. The most northerly chalk stream in Britain, as it, as it happens. That's a sign. And, uh, and we closed the fish farm, no, we bought the fish farm and we closed it down. We've turned it into a fantastic nature reserve. So that's very typical sort of nature conservation kind of thing to do. And we have one full-time member of staff on this and about 40 volunteers. <coughs> and that costs quite a lot of money, and it's 40 hectares. And 40 hectares in the context of Yorkshire is nothing. Um, and, of course, in the context of the UK, e even smaller. So rewilding takes you down a different line. So what, it sa what rewilding would say, and this is why I think it's additional to nature conservation, it would say, look, let's think about this in a different way. Let's do some interventions, they may be costly, but let's do some interventions that allow natural processes to restore themselves, that allows trophic complexity to restore itself. And then we can just stand back a bit, and it's a much cheaper way of doing nature conservation. That's really important. And we also know that it's beginning to work, because what we can see is that there is a spectacular comeback of wildlife happening across continental Europe. Not in the UK yet, but across continental Europe. And it's really staggering. We're going to redo this report next year. Um, but this is from 2012, 2014 figures. And you can see the sorts of numbers coming back. So just look at, for example, beaver. So in 1970, across the whole of the European continent, only about 75,000 beavers. So pretty rare. And so 2003, 337,000. It's, it's, it's much, much higher now. Wolves, only 4,000 in 1970. In 2012, 12,000 wolves across Europe. Wolves are now back in every country in Europe, apart from, of course, the UK. So they're back everywhere. They were found in Belgium just two years ago, the last country on mainland Europe to come back. So we can see this is happening, and it's happening partly because of a reduced persecution, Habitats Directive, Birds Directive, all that kind of stuff, and partly because of this abandonment or this cessation of agriculture on, on very marginal agricultural land. Is it relevant in the UK context? Well, you know, we know that there's some huge successes in the UK. So we've seen, for example, red kite be reintroduced and, and is now abundant. Fantastic. So you can see red kite um, up, up the motorways, flying over the motorways near Leeds. Yeah, I mean, who would have thought 20 years ago that that was possible? Actually, I think this is even more impressive, the buzzard, because nobody did this purposely. When I grew up, I grew up in eastern England, absolutely zero chance of seeing a buzzard in eastern England when I was a child, and now they're absolutely everywhere, simply because we removed persecution of buzzards and allowed that species to come back. So a UK comeback for wildlife is absolutely possible, and we, we should be starting to think that. And when I say UK, I should also be saying the British Isles. I appreciate that. Not only that, is um, from that comeback of wildlife, from that wildlife abundance, we can start to think about some of those socioeconomic opportunities that rewilding could give us. So, of course, these natural services, the, the ecosystem services, to use the jargon of the trade, but these are these free, ostensibly free services, and we kind of take them for granted, but when we lose them, it's really expensive. We're thinking about things like clean air. It's obvious in a way, isn't it? Clean water. The cost of treating polluted water for drinking is enormous. Carbon storage, to pull that carbon back out of the atmosphere. Even if we get to net zero, we're still a bit stuffed. We have to pull the carbon back out and into the land, which we know peat bogs and forests can do. Flood control, the sort of example we had in Holland, drought control and so on. We can think about the new enterprises that we can get off some of this rewilded land, especially nature tourism. Tourism is one of the fastest growing, is the fastest growing part of, of the world economy, and it's nature and activity tourism that's the, is the fastest growing part of that economy. And so these are huge opportunities in a, in, a, in a very urban Europe now. These are huge possibilities that can create rural prosperity. Sustainable hunting rather than unsustainable hunting. Sustainable forestry for sustainable agriculture and so on. Less dependence on subsidies. So rather than having a subsidised rural economy, what about an economy that's based on these sorts of enterprises? These are landscapes of the futures that we really can build. It's really important. And this is all about working with communities, about recreating those cultural traditions that were based upon the wildlife 
around those uh, communities. So it's not working against, it's like absolutely with communities. It's a new conservation narrative. It's a completely different appreciation of nature. Biodiversity derived from natural processes, rich, abundant wildlife. We don't know where we're going, it's future orientated. Nature has an ally in solving things like climate change, solving things like flooding, solving things like rural depopulation. So really cost effective, really exciting, progressive, forward thinking new narrative that I think we can, uh, we can latch on to. And just to give you an example, you know, if we look at where I live in Yorkshire, you know, we've got big problems with flooding. If we rewilded those uplands, we, we for example, could reduce the amount of flooding by storing water in the uplands rather than in my house, which would be pleasing. And we could also uh, absorb carbon from the atmosphere in the peatlands. There's big peatlands in the Yorkshire hills. Uh, and rather than burning them and releasing that carbon into the atmosphere, we could be once again sequestering carbon into those peatlands, creating the coal of the future, maybe. Um, so those natural solutions in the climate stress world are particularly important. So that's the kind of narrative of rewild. And just to give you some examples. So we work across um, 10 areas in Europe where we're trying to... Uh, demonstrate rewilding at scale. I just want to take you a few of those areas. So this one is in the Coa Valley in northern Portugal. And there's some fantastic rock engravings, Mesolithic art. When you look at that Mesolithic art in the Coa Valley, what do you see? Well, you see aurochs, and here it is. Beautiful wild cattle, extinct. Wild horses, tarpan, extinct. Wild boar, wild goat, not there anymore. Um, red deer and so on. So you can see that these Mesolithic people were living in, in a bioabundance of mega herbivores. The mega herbivores were the things that they were trying to depict in those paintings, which are gorgeous. Um, and, and of course, that, that's long gone. You also see a, a, a gradual abandonment of agriculture. You can see here, this is rather typical. You can see some of the terraces are still in production. We've got a few olive terraces here. But the vast majority of the terraces, which were once were, we, were being used only 10, 20, 30 years ago, the vast majority are out of agriculture now. They're simply not being used for agriculture, and you've had a big rural depopulation. So if you started to think about rewilding that environment, what could you get? Actually something really quite special. You know, it'd be something like the African savanna. It'd be something like a going to on an African safari experience with these huge herds of wild horses and wild cattle and birds of prey flying around and the rest of it. Imagine what that, imagine if you had that landscape. No need to go to the Serengeti, just go to northern Portugal. It's much cheaper and the experience would be just as fantastic. What an incredible start-up that would be for the local economy. So we are reintroducing wild horse equivalents, in this case, um, Patocus horses, I think and wild cattle equivalents. So this is what we call the Taurus. Taurus Foundation in the Netherlands is backbreeding the most primitive breeds of cattle using DNA analysis to get as close to a wild auroch as you can. You'd never get back to auroch, of course, but as close as you can, an impressive beast, reintroducing those into that environment, starting to create that dynamic and trophic cascade within those environments. And then on the back of that, you can start to create these new enterprises. So these are luxury B&Bs, and here's this first attempt to create a European safari experience. So here's the sorts of things that you would do in Africa. You know, tented accommodation underneath the stars, beautiful food and all the rest of it. Doing that in northern Portugal. And we can see that sort of thing. We could do that across the whole of Europe. Here's another example, Velibit Mountains. So in the Velibit Mountains, we have a beautiful chain of limestone hills along the Croatian coast, two big national parks. And in between there are uh, essentially hunting grounds, forested hunting grounds. And, of course, the wildlife is pretty massacred in those hunting grounds. So we're buying those hunting grounds out. And instead of shooting wildlife, we're shooting pictures. And that's allowing the wildlife to come back and creating a real spectacle in that, in that area. And you can see the return of the big animals, the bears and the wolves and so on. So much, much richer wildlife driving the, uh, a nature tourism that, were, that is complementary to the coastal tourism that you see on the Croatian coast that some of us might have been to. In the Danube Delta, this is quite different. So here, collective Soviet agriculture clearly collapsed back in 1989, uh, and, the, and much of that agricultural land, which was pretty uneconomic at the time, um, has, uh, is not used in anymore. 
So we're starting to um, allow the water back into the Danube Delta floodplain to restoring that kind of incredible wildlife diversity, reinvigorating the whole nature tourism economy. So again, and we know, I mean, we know this is very successful. Lots and lots of people coming to the Danube um, to experience, you know, some of the most incredible wildlife in Europe and encouraging that, bringing things like Kulan back to the steppes of the Ukraine. So the Kulan are the wild ass of Europe, which are virtually extinct, but um, there's just a few clinging on on the Asian side. So we've brought that back in, bringing water buffalo back to Europe for the first time and so on. Really interesting stuff. In the central Apennines, and again, a slightly different approach there. Some lovely uh, national parks uh, and, and actually with some incredible wildlife. So mask and brown bear, subspecies of European brown bear, critically endangered because it's hemmed into the national park. It's hemmed into the National Park because once they migrate out of the National Parks, people worry about them, they're not used to them, they get poached, they hit cars, they hit, you know, whatever, they get poisoned and so on. And so actually what we're trying to do is to create communities which see bears as a positive. And they see bears as a positive, one, because they're educated about that. Secondly, that um, uh, they see it as a positive in terms of, uh, of, of the economy. And thirdly, their properties and so on are, are protected from damage and so on. So we are creating these coexistence corridors, or bear smart communities as we call it, allowing bears and other wildlife, particularly the scavenger community, to expand out across the Apennines. And again, really important in terms of the nature tourism economy. And this is one of my favourites in Romania. We talked about it earlier. These fantastic beech forests stretching around the Carpathian Arc. Um, and here... I mean, these are already very wild landscapes, but here we're, we're reintroducing the lost, one of the great lost herbivores, mega herbivores of Europe, European bison. So European bison were down to just 54 animals in, uh, in the 1920s, so teetering on the edge of extinction. Uh, captive breeding programme has been going on for the last 70 years, and they're now just starting to be reintroduced into the wild. Been in uh, Bailevesa Forest in Poland for a little while, in Belarus, and here we are introducing them into the Southern Carpathians. So the very first wild bison back in Romania for 350 years. Really exciting project. Go on and on about it. So a few really important messages I think I've got. Uh, so one is, one is that um, what we need to do is, is, is not be too prescriptive about this. What we're trying to do is just to, re to, to reintroduce rewilding and not be too objective. What we want to get to is nature knows best. Let's come back to my things. Secondly, Europe is a guiding comment. The wild, wildlife comeback in Europe is absolutely on. And it's really worth looking at some of those figures there, you know. There are 1,800 bears, 1,800 wolves, bears rather, in, in North America and 17,000 in Europe. You know, there are... 5,000 wolves in North America and 12,000 in Europe. You know, we're, we're aware it's where it's at, you know, in terms of this wildlife comeback. It's not in the USA, it's, it's, in, it's in Europe. We don't think Europe as a very wild continent, but it can be a very wild continent, and we're also, and it's already starting, which is really exciting. So that's the, the second message. Third message is we actually need to make it happen. So it's not enough just to me talking about it. We need to make it happen. So, and, and it's starting to happen. So we're starting to see country-level uh, initiatives happening. So we've got you Rewild in Ukraine, Portugal, Britain, Sweden, where we're seeing organisations coming together to push rewilding at a national level. We're seeing new ones popping up. So we have Spain, France and Finland um, on, on their way. We also see these area or landscape scale initiatives. I talked about a couple of them, the Apennines, Belabit, Oda Delta, but I could add to that the Rodopi Mountains uh, in Bulgaria and uh, stretching across into Greece and so on. And then under Lisbeth Rousing's Alcadia Foundation, this has also been done at scale across, across other parts of Europe. So another um, Carpathian project in Romania, um, uh, Cairngorms Connect in, in, in the Northern Highlands and so on. So you can see there, there's a map starting to build of rewilding projects across the whole of Europe. So it's not just theor theory, this. This is happening on the ground. It's just starting to start. It's very exciting. My fourth message is that, well, this is quite new, rewilding. And pretty much every U 
policy works against you. So we need to start dealing with things like common agricultural policy, uh, fisheries policies and so on, uh, as, as always in nature conservation. Uh, but there's, there's real prospects on the horizon. In, in the UK, of course, Brexit, for good or bad, actually is creating possibilities around how we could introduce rewilding into, into what was a very intensive agricultural landscape in the UK. Um, but in, in Europe itself, in the EU, um, you, the European Biodiversity Strategy uh, has just been uh, released, um, pushing for a 15% restoration target which will be a legally binding target. So 15% of the land being restored for wildlife and rewilding, of course, is one of the ways that that could be achieved. My fifth message is it's absolutely pertinent on islands. I think there's two reasons for that. One is that islands create uh, diversity because each island is unique, of course. Um, so there's a different mix of species and a different mix of genetics on an island. So actually allowing islands to rewild in parts is really exciting. But much more importantly is what's surrounding it about it. There's this fantastic opportunity for marine rewilding because it's so straightforward. It's so much easier to rewild the seas than it is uh, on land. So marine wildly is really fundamental. My sixth and last message is that it's really important we communicate about this. It's really, really important that we tell people how exciting this opportunity is, this new narrative for nature conservation. That it's not about thinking back into the past. It's about imagining a new future. We don't really know exactly what that's going to be, but we know it's going to be wilder, it's going to be more prosperous, and it's going to be really exciting.